Welcome to my next lecture. I'm not sure what lecture number this is. I haven't decided that yet, but it'll be tacked on towards the end of, uh, of the pre-stressed concrete course. Um, I've been asked for years uh, by a variety of people to do a video on the complete design of a two-way flat plate system. I am going to do the entire thing by hand to match PT data, our software. I'm going to talk about finite element software. In fact, that brings me to a point. My reason for doing this is an extension of the course that I'm teaching at Cal Poly and I've taught at UCLA. Um, this is for those students who have now moved on or probably in a, a good firm somewhere and are designing post-tension flat plates. Post-tension flat plates are the most popular uh, system out there right now. There, you, you almost can't drive through uh, any major or even minor city without seeing some type of flat plate post-tension concrete being constructed. Um, Cal State University is on fire building these. UCs also, um, they're everywhere. Apartments, wrap, wrap parking structures, those are our bread and butter and have been currently for a while. So I'm actually showing you, for some reason, providing a free video to show all of my competitors exactly what I think, how we approach these, and why we do what we do. If you can figure out why I do that, then please email me and let me know, because uh, I can't figure it out. Anyway, um, that's the purpose of this video. If you are looking for a video that gives you bullet points, PowerPoint type presentation of how to and get through it as fast as possible, this is not the video for you. I am going to ramble, I am going to tell stories, I'm going to digress, I'm gonna do exactly what I've always done at UCLA and Cal Poly. You'll hear stories about when I took uh, finite elements from Ed Wilson in 1989 at Berkeley, when I took uh, flat plate design and learned equivalent, the equivalent frame method from Jack Maley at Berkeley in 1989, experiences I've had. So I, I'm going to ramble and be all over the place in and out of this example. So I'll tell you right now, if that's not for you, cat videos. That's what you need to watch. Everybody loves cat videos and, and nobody disagrees on how those should be done. So go watch cat videos if, if you don't want to hear all of my opinions. I'm going to show you what I do. I'm going to give away all my secrets. I'm going to show you how this is done by hand and code is met, but you're going to have to suffer through my opinions on uh, and, and um, my stories. So, okay, here we go. I am going to do, this example is in our book, uh, it's, it's the second example in the two-way flat plate chapter. We are constantly updating, we are constantly adding photographs, design examples, uh, so I'm not even sure what chapter this is going to be when you watch this, so I want to be careful about saying what page or what chapter. Uh, our buildings keep having fires, by the way, and being, the, the structure they're supporting being uh, burned to the ground, except for it's still on our, our podium. So uh, we get those pictures in. It's a great time to do another edition of the book every time one of our uh, structures burns. I'm going to do a relatively simple example, but everything that's necessary will be in this. Uh, this is an elevation. I'm looking at a three span flat plate parking structure, 14 by 18 columns. The 18 is in the C1 direction. 10 foot two floor heights. Uh, this is a plan of the system. I've got an eight inch post tension flat plate. Uh, in the book, we talk about actually how to arrive at the eight inch uh, thickness based on span to depth ratio. There are a few things I am not going to cover that, that are in the book that I've decided not to, uh, to put in the video. But we get to an eight inch post tension flat plate and. Um, in this case, we will run, the, the banded tendons will be assumed to run along the straight column lines. That is what we're always trying to do. We always want to find the direction in the building where the columns are the straightest. If, if we can find a straight line of columns repetitiously, we will run the banded or grouped tendons along that line. We do not want to bend significantly banded groups of tendons. As uh, 
I watch, I, I am part of the CSU Seismic Review Board and as a member of that board, we do a lot more than seismic review. I am reviewing lots of, of post-tension structures for the entire Cal State system designed by various engineers. You see now I'm reviewing a number of those flat plate post-tension structures. Uh, I've been involved in a few lawsuits, so I'm also going to talk about those things and those designs that I see. Um, so in these reviews that I'm seeing, I'm seeing some very aggressive band bends and things like that. Now, you shouldn't do that. PTI has a whole bunch of recommendations, but the main reason is if you do that long enough, it's going to explode on you. It has with me. I've made every mistake possible in post-tensioning. Brian and I have aggressively tried to push the limits in various uh, projects. Eventually, they fail. Eventually, you have some type of blowout. Eventually, the curved band tries to straighten out, rips off a whole bunch of concrete off the top. You've got a lot of explaining to do. The, the recommendations that I'm going to make are basically because I have already failed at this. And if you'll just listen to me, you won't have to redo my mistake. These aren't theoretical things. <laughs> I've got pictures in our book. I don't know who else writes a book and puts pictures of their own failures in their design, of their designs in their book, but we have them. Lots of them aren't ours. We were hired as experts to come in and evaluate, but, but there's stuff in there that we have made mistakes on. And one of them that I, as I get older and older and design so much square feet of this, we try to keep these banded tendons as straight as possible. We will put in slab bands instead of bending them over to a column uh, just because <laughs> we've had failures and they will fail every once in a while. So anyway, we try to run the banded tendons along the straightest line as we can. It wouldn't matter if these columns all shift one parking stall below and, and these are not in line. It's really irrelevant if you can run the banded tendons along the straight column lines and you can run the uniform tendons to the banded tendons. You can have a very orthogonal post-tensioning layout even though your column layout may be a mess. So uh, that's the trick, I and mean, that's where it starts. That's where the early decisions are made, and if you don't make that decision, which direction to run your banded tendons, which direction to run your uniforms, you don't make that one correctly, the rest of everything <laughs> can go south very quickly. So that's uh, recommendation number one. Find the direction, and if the, if the architect needs some help in getting some of the columns straighter, suggest it, and explain to them why. Um, we have some pretty good success with that. We train our architects that we work with why it's important. We only ask for one direction to be relatively straight and we let them do anything they want in the other direction. But that straight direction is the banded group. Then all we have to do is run uniforms to the band, to the banded tendons. Okay, so that's, this is the situation. 29 foot six bays. Uh, we are going to approach this using the equivalent frame method. That is the method by which our program uh, analyzes this and designs this. ADAPT for years did the same thing for probably 40 years. Those two programs were the primary programs that existed and literally billions of square feet were designed and constructed successfully using the equivalent frame method. Um, I understand that there are uh, many more software systems and the finite element method has uh, become very popular. We are going to talk about that. Uh, we, we will discuss what a finite element program is doing to satisfy the code, but this example is going to match PT data, our software, and I will show you that. Okay, so just to be real clear, the uniform tendons, we are designing the uniform tended run. The strip that I'm taking out of this plate is a 29 foot six strip. Uniform tendons, meaning we're gonna come up with a kips per foot in this zone and design that way. In this direction, the banded tendons will be specified as a specific number, round number of tendons and a force running along this direction. 
The truth of the matter is the design approach is exactly the same whether or not you're doing uniform tendons or banded tendons. There's no numeric technical difference to either one of those runs. Really the only difference is that in the banded group of tendons you need to make sure you have a round number of tendons. In the uniform tendons you're, you're coming up with a force per foot, but both of those can be equated to an area of steel of post tensioning in the design strip that you're looking at. Okay, let's look at the loading on the slab. An eight inch slab weighs 100 pounds per square foot. In a parking structure, we'll say that the superimposed dead load is mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and miscellaneous. And the more I do structural observations for decades now, and I look at how much electrical conduit is getting put in these decks, I'm convinced this probably should be a negative number because the conduit's actually taking out concrete. It's not adding any load. The plumbing is incredibly light. There really isn't any miscellaneous, I guess you can call paint for parking st uh, stalls as some type of miscellaneous little load, but the truth of the matter is not even sure how we get to the three pounds a square foot, but we'll call it three pounds a square foot. So the total dead load we've got on this system is 103 pounds per square foot. A parking structure with um, uh, regular standard parking is 40 pounds a square foot. This used to be 50 reducible in older codes. For, uh, for us older people, we'll remember that. Now it's 40 pounds a square foot, unreducible. It doesn't really matter if this is a long span, one-way slab, two-way slab. All parking is designed for 40 pounds a square foot right now. In this case, we will design for 5,000 PSI concrete, but specify an early 3,000 PSI concrete in three days so that we can stress in three to four days. This is very typical. Every once in a while I see a design that specifies 4,000 PSI but wants stressing done early. I've never seen a mixed design where you didn't get 5,000 PSI at least if you specified 3,000 in three days. It just there really isn't a mix that can get to 3,000 in three days and then takes the rest of the month to barely get to 4,000. So you're gonna get more than 5,000 if you specify 3,000 at three days. So but really we'll conservatively do all our design at 5,000. Of course, the only tendons available to us today are half inch diameter tendons, 270 KSI. Used to be we had stress relieved and lower types of uh, of ultimate strength steel that's all gone by the wayside this is pretty much the only thing that's left and as of the 2014 code all tendons must be encapsulated it is irrelevant how close to uh, an aggressive environment you are it doesn't matter if you're uh, in Arizona or if you're in San Francisco right on the bay you will be encapsulating all tendons and by the way I see that in the reviews that I am doing I see encapsulated tendons specified, but then we look at pore strips and we still see tails of tendons coming in. You can't have a tail of a tendon anymore in an encapsulated system. Tails all need to be cut off, they need to be grease injected, they need to be capped even in the pore strips. Uh, at the construction joints, they have to be completely sealed. There's no more allowing some amount of tendon to be exposed at the dead end. All those old details for everybody need to be fixed and brought up to speed. They need to be shown as encapsulated. And if I'm reviewing your project, I will look for that through your typical details and make sure that that gets cleaned up. Okay, just like we did in the beam example, let's estimate the pre-stressing force. Okay, I'm going to move over here and I realize I am off the screen. That's okay. You don't need to see me. The long span case, as long as the loading is the same, will always be the controlling span. So we have a 30 foot dimension. I may have forgotten to mention what these dimensions were, but 15 foot, shorter end bays, a 30-foot interior two-way driving lane, parking stalls are, are coming in here and sticking out a little bit past the column. So we'll go to that interior 30-foot span. We know that we'll want to fully drape. That only makes sense. You should never have 
your longest span not have a complete drape. So we're looking at one inch um, cover top and bottom to a half inch tendon. So the CGS is going to be one and a quarter inch from both the top and the bottom of this eight inch deck. We established the profile in the controlling span. Based on years of experience, we will balance approximately at a minimum of 65% of the concrete weight. We'll also provide a minimum 150 PSI of average compression. Neither one of these are code requirements. One of the problems with post-tension concrete is there are really not very many code requirements. Um, you can really come up with an absolutely terrible design if you want to be code compliant. And that's, that's one of the problems, in my opinion. I, I'm not a fan of adding more code or, or more restrictions, but I'm a big fan of everybody understanding what um, the standard of practice, the standard of care is, and all the recommendations made by PTI and ACI. So good design practice, you should know whatever you're designing, a one-way slab, a two-way slab, beam system, you should have a set minimum in your office of the weight of the concrete that you are balancing. Not the weight of dead load superimposed, not on a podium, part of the weight of the building up above. Really, in my opinion, this should be related only to the concrete weight, because as you're stressing, that's all that's there when you're initially stressing. And most of our problems will come immediately in post-tensioning. They won't wait to happen. So that's why <laughs> you're really interested in what the weight is and the, the load that's being balanced at the moment it's being stressed. So we focus on just the concrete that's there. We will also in our office in this situation want a minimum of 150 PSI average compression. The code for two-way flat plates requires 125 minimum. We find that the designs are best at about 150 to 175. That's the sweet spot. So in our office we won't be less than 150. Um, we have the weight of an 8-inch concrete slab, so 65% of the weight of 100 pounds a square foot in an 8-inch slab is 65 pounds a square foot. That's how much we want to balance to start with. Remember, we are, we're starting somewhere. Now we can randomly guess, we can let the program run and do it. PT Data will come up with the design for you that actually is completely code compliant. You really don't have to think about it, but we're in the classroom right now. We're starting, we're doing these things by hand, so you're going to think about what the program is actually doing to get to an initial design. May or may not work, but you're going to start someplace that makes sense. Okay, so A being the drape, remember our definition, the full drape is the distance from the lowest point to a line connecting the two endpoints in a span. We can get a maximum drape of 5.5 inches here. So the equivalent load is 8 FA over L squared. This has all been developed in past lectures. I can rewrite this. Since I know what A is, what I really need to know is what force are we going to start at. So I rewrite this in the controlling bay in terms of force required. The force required is going to be the balance load or the equivalent load multiplied by the span squared divided by 8 because we're a parabola times A, and we'll convert that to feet. So I would like to start with an initial force. It looks like a force, that, you know, a force that will balance 65% of the weight of the concrete is 16 kips per foot. We don't know if it's gonna work, but based on a lot of experience, it's a good starting point. I also wanna check what force would, it would take to have an average compression of 150 PSI. 150 PSI over per foot times an 8 inch slab would be 14.4 kips per foot. That's less than the 16 kips per foot to balance 65% of the load. So we'll stick with a try, not a use, but a try 16 kips per foot. If it doesn't work, we start bumping things. We start, if it works by too much, you know, I don't know if we're going to decrease anything because I don't want to go below the 65%, but this is design. So at 16 kips a foot, multiplied by a 29.5 foot tributary width of this strip that I'm looking at, divided by 26.62 kips per tendon gives me, in this design strip, 17.7 tendons. Now,
Normally in my designs that would be fine. I would relate this and call out a kip per foot with an extension over the length of the building that this same design applies and just ask the supplier to provide 16 kips a foot. Um, I understand these things are changing with the new software. I don't agree with it. I don't think we should be designing or producing shop drawings. I think we should produce design drawings. Our drawings, in my humble opinion, should say provide so many kips per foot, give them a drape, in your general notes, specify a maximum spacing of uh, code mandated maximum spacing of tendons and let the expert uh, detailer figure out how to lay those out in this project. They'll get them around openings. They'll, they'll do a fantastic, that's their job. That's their specialty. Uh, these days, your software is now drawing your, uh, your shop drawings. You're eliminating one of the real experts in the, in the chain <laughs> of people who are involved involved in this design and you're allowing the software to make some decisions and, and um, anyway not a big fan of doing that but I understand I'm old and I've been told I'm old and times are changing and I gotta keep up or get out of the way so anyway still think drawing these as design drawings makes sense with that said I don't want to do calculations for this example with 17.7 Tendons. I could. I could relate that to an area of steel in the calculations that I'm going to do the strength design with. Um, I would rather have a round number. I think it's easier for you. Uh, it's not necessary, but for clarity, I am going to, in this example, round that 17.7 to 18 tendons. I think it's going to make some of the calculations that I'm doing just a little clearer. So 18 tendons times 26.62 kips per tendon divided by the 29.5 strip width is 16.24 kips per foot. So that's actually my starting number. I am going to have 16.24 kips per foot. And if, that, if everything works, that'll be the final design. Okay. Be careful, this is just like the design example with the beam I did. You've now figured out, have to figure out what the actual equivalent balance loads are. They weren't what you estimated before. Those aren't, you know, we, we figured out what you needed to be at 65% balance load, but now we have come up with an actual pre-stressing force and drape. So in span two, we need to go back and figure out what actual equivalent load we've provided. We're using 16.24, we are using the full drape. With that, 8FA over L squared is 1.952 kips per foot. So that is the equivalent load or balance load in the controlling span. So now the question is, let's find the drape in the end bays. In this condition, we wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense to drop off tendons. You actually can't. You have to run all your tendons to where they can get stressed. So, this 16.24 kips per foot is going to run all three bays. So that's now a given in this bay. So the unknown is the drape. Now I see a lot of software, I see a lot of programs, designs coming from particularly the finite element programs where everything in the floor has just been draped its full dimension. And that clearly is being done by somebody who doesn't understand or hasn't taken this course. <laughs> you don't want to balance all the load you can at every location you can. You can actually create tremendous problems by doing that. You're trying to look at a uniform, trying to come up with a uniform balancing of the concrete load that you have. So we don't want to fully drape a 15 foot bay. In fact, you can overbalance to the point that you can explode concrete when that's your approach. So we want to find a lower drape than the maximum possible such that we're balancing an about equivalent amount in all bays, in the entire floor system. We'll do the same in the banded direction when we turn around and design the banded tension direction, which we're not going to do for this example, but we, we would. The idea is to balance about 65-70% of all the concrete in the whole floor, regardless of where the columns are and the spans are. That creates a nice flat design. Deflections are become very small. Everything works out well. So, let's look at the drape in the end base. This now becomes the variable and the force is the known. 
So I go back to the same balance load equation. I still want to balance 65% of the concrete weight. This is not the controlling span. Uh, and as you remember from homework assignments and from the um, discussions in previous lectures, we might want to balance less load in the non-controlling spans. But right now we're going to stick with the minimum of 65%. You do not really want to balance more in the non-controlling spans than the controlling span. The controlling span should be where you're balancing the most percentage of your load. A little bit less than the non-controlling spans. That, trust me, will give you a nice uh, tension stress distribution. So, the A value that we're solving for out of this now, the equivalent load is 65 pounds a square foot. We have a 15 foot span, eight times F, gives an A value or a drape in the end bays, the two end bays are symmetric, of 1.35 inches. So the dimension from the bottom of the slab is eight inches, the full eight inches, minus 4 plus 1.25 over 2, 4, 1.25 divided by 2 is that dimension, minus the 1.35 A dimension. So we've calculated we need approximately 1.35. If I do this calculation, that would be 4.025 inches off the bottom. We don't want an oddball number like this. We'd like something more round usually in these flat plates in the quarter inch dimension increment. So in this case, we'll try four inches. We're very close to four inches. Let's just put it at four inches. You'll actually see why I did that in a second too. So the actual A dimension is eight inches minus the 4.25 minus four is 1.375 inches. The actual equivalent load then using that real value that we're going to actually have, the 16.24 kips per foot we've decided, that's the A dimension. By putting this at four inches, we've got the width of the bay divided by 15 squared, 1.952 kips per foot. Exactly the same as we had over here. <laughs> Is that necessary? No. Is that very useful for a guy who's gonna do a design example and put a video out on the internet? Yes. Uh, this is going to make my life easier. I'll be very honest with you, I'm an expert at making my life easier. If these two are the same exactly, the dead load is going to be the same in all spans. The live load is going to be the same in all spans. I'm going to cut down the moment distributions that I have to do and show you. <laughs> so my life does get easier. Whether or not this is exactly the same number as this is really irrelevant and it won't typically be and that's fine. We are balancing though the same weight of concrete exactly in each bay. So that's a good thing. You usually want to, unless you have kind of an unusual situation or your loading is changing, this is a good goal to have. Balance about the same in all of your spans. I'm gonna make my first major uh, digression from the example that we're doing because I wanna make a point. This is based on something that just came up in a peer review that I was doing. It's very frustrating for me because I was unsuccessful at convincing the person of statics and um, sum of forces, Newton stuff, things like that. And uh, I, I'm okay if other people wanna do stupid things in my opinion, but my Cal Poly students, my UCLA students, I don't want you doing things that don't make sense. And I want you to understand basic, fundamental, simple, static things. So the issue at hand was how to lay out uniform tendons and how to achieve a uniform compression in the slab, if that's, that's the goal. And in this little example that I've set up, here's the goal. I want five kips per foot everywhere. I can divide that by a slab thickness and get a uniform compression stress, but same thing, five kips a foot is what I'm trying to achieve in this. This is 100 foot long. I've got a 10 foot bridge in between. The job I was reviewing didn't look this, like this. I'm trying to protect the innocent so I'm not making the job look exactly like it was, but there could be, and oftentimes in malls and even in parking structures, these are split with the two ends reconnecting with each other. Uh, malls have bridges crossing them. There's a, there's a whole bunch of potential structures out there that have two plates connected by 
pieces of plate and pieces of concrete. And, and if your goal is to have a uniform pre-compression in all areas of this, you can achieve that very simply by always running your, ten, your uniform tendons straight. Now banded tendons, we tend to have to curve them a little bit. We try not to, but we have to get to the supports. So those will bend. We have to be really careful doing that. Perfect world, everything is straight. But um, the uniform should always run straight. There, there is really, other than missing a very small little opening or, or going around a small opening, these things should always be run straight. Now for 50 years, post-tensioners have called out a force that they want. For instance, I would call out five kips per foot. If that's what I wanted, I would draw one of these. I draw an arrow from here to here, a leader line, extent line, and I'd say, Mr. Post-Tensioning Supplier, provide me with five kips per foot. They would know that there's a maximum spacing per code of 8T or five feet, um, whichever one's smaller. You've got that on your drawings. Post-tensioners are experts. The suppliers know that. They would make sure, while they may bundle some tendons, they would make sure never to exceed that spacing. And as long as the uniform tendons are all straight, then the spacing's easy to maintain and verify, and it makes all the sense in the world. Recently, software has been developed that are drawing the actual shop drawings, which I consider to be extremely dangerous for our industry. We don't do that in my office. We still do traditional, as we have for the last 50 years in our industry, design sets of drawings where we call out a force. We call out a force in the banded groups of tendons, we'll call out a force and a number of tendons. But in the uniform direction, we just call out the force per foot that we want. In the new programs, if you are going to produce a set that's really the shop drawings, first of all, you've eliminated uh, a major expert in the chain of command of these drawings going from an initial design set to being built. You know, there are a lot of people that can look at these along the way, plan checkers, suppliers, um, internally, maybe peer reviewers like me and try to catch any mistakes. So that by the time it gets built, a lot of people with different expertise have taken a look at this and, and at least said something if they see something that looks really wrong. You, by drawing your own shop drawings, you've eliminated probably the most qualified person in that chain of command, the shop drawing supplier, to allow them to lay out tendons to look out for areas that you might not have the spacing or enough for, you know, something, whatever it is. These guys do this for a living. Um, so the issue that came up was um, the engineer decided it was very important to take a number of the tendons, much more than I'm showing, and get them through these pieces, these slivers of concrete. And I tried to argue, A, you have two problems. When you do that, they were clearly exceeding the maximum spacing. By bending the uniform tendons, they were creating gaps that were greater than five feet, clearly greater than five feet, much greater than five feet. And I said, don't, you really should never curve uniforms. Just, if they hit an edge, just stop them. Just stop them. You will, by default, then get uniform compression. And this person just wasn't buying it or didn't care, but I think really just wasn't buying it. So I've got this simple example that I'm showing. Along here, these are all anchors. Whether or not they're stressing or dead end doesn't matter. So I've got 20 anchors in 100 feet. Therefore, I have 500 kips of force. Every one of these is 25 kips pushing into this slab. So the sum of force pushing on this edge of slab is 500 kips. Now, just because I've allowed the spacing to go through and not change the spacing, two tendons will go through this 10-foot bridge section. Good. So there is no anchor here and there's no anchor here. But these tendons get anchored where they run into an edge. So I've got nine tendons anchored here for a force of 
a total force along this edge of 225 kips pushing back. Remember statics and Newton. 225 kips pushing back. So the difference between this 500 kips and these two forces has to be statically the force that's in that bridge. Forget the number of tendons that I show. Just if you just wiped out all the tendons and I told you you had 225 kips here, 225 kips here, 500 here, by default you would have to have the difference going through here. Forget the tendons, forget looking at the tendons as if you couldn't see them. So the force in the bridge would be the 500 kips minus 225 minus 225. There would have to be simple math. I apologize if I'm boring some of you. You can go watch CAD videos while I'm doing this. Come back in you know 10 minutes. There would have to be 50 kips. Now, I tried arguing that you can calculate, you don't have to add up all the anchors and all the opposing anchors and see what's left getting through. You can just look at the number of tendons that go through the bridge. And this is where the argument was that, well, no, I've got a lot of tendons grouped up going through this bridge, but that doesn't mean I have that much compression in there. And I said, yes, it does. It has to. Um, I can calculate that same 50 kips by just saying I had two tendons times 25 kips a tendon or 50 kips. It seems straightforward. I've never had to ha make this argument, but I see that as software is coming out where uniform tendons can be drawn by the engineer, apparently it's not good enough to just draw them straight in a, in a uniform spacing. They, all the uniforms are starting to curve and go places now. That's the wrong approach. You know, I, <laughs> 50 years ago, you know, an eight inch flat plate, post tension going 30 feet, or, or, or a parking slab, let's see, flat plate going 30 feet, eight inches would work. You know, you, you could put about 175 PSI, and that was back in 1950 or 60. Then we went to, um, you know, that's back when it was hand drawn or, or drawn by pen. You know, then we went to AutoCAD. AutoCAD came along in the 80s, 90s. We drew it with AutoCAD, used more sophisticated software, and it turns out a parking slab going 30 feet needed to be about eight inches, and if that had 175 PSI in it, it worked then too. And then AutoCAD went to Revit, and we went to finite element analyses, and we every technological advancement we're doing, and it turns out parking slab going 30 feet needs to be about eight inches and about 175 psi and it will work very well all the technological changes are how we get to the same answer and they have been for the last 40 years but now all of a sudden these technological advances we'll call them in software are actually changing the construction and that's what's bothering me that that part and we can just come up with 18 different ways throughout my lifetime of getting to the same answer and that's fine old people like me just have to learn new software and new things but i already know the end answer it's just how to show a plan checker how to get there but this is actually changing construction and that bothers me so here's my simple example i was unsuccessful at convincing this engineer but i want every one of my cal poly and ucla students to understand this if i decided to take these two tendons and turn them in also so instead of two tendons i have four tendons so what i've done over here is i've just taken those two and put them in the bridge now this is the argument I was having, that this made no consequential change to the compression in the bridge. I said, absolutely it does. So let's go through the statics. Again, I have 500 kips, I have 20 anchors at 25, I hate when I don't finish. Okay, at 25 kips, I've got 500 total kips coming down. I now have eight, whereas I had nine before, I have eight anchors pushing back up at 25 kips per anchor on two sides, 200 kips and 200 kips, 500 kips coming down, 400 kips going up. Statics says I could just show you those forces and erase all the tendons. If I told you you had 500 kips of total post tensioning pushing down and on these edges, I'm offsetting that, counteracting that with 400 kips. Statics would have to say that 100 kips got into this bridge. Now, to me, the way I have always looked at this was I could just count the tendons in that bridge 
I've got four tens tw times 25 kips or 100 kips. Either way, <laughs> you should see that if you start taking tendons and they're not uniformly spaced to give you that five kips per foot, and you start bending those uniform tendons, where you tighten those up, you're going to, you know, in this case, I doubled it. I've got 10 kips per foot in the bridge. If you double the, the compression, if you start it off at 175, 200, and then you decided you need to double up in these small sections. These are the ones that explode, by the way. These are the ones that get over balance. The smaller sections of concrete are the ones you really should worry about. They're the last ones you want to load up with pre-stressing and over compress. But in this simple case, I have doubled the, the pre-compression in that bridge. And I can get to it by either showing statics which I shouldn't have to do, or just showing that the number of tendons that goes through each one of these connector segments divided by the length, the width of that um, segment will give me the kips per foot. And the number of tendons times the force in the tendons will give me the force that's in that connecting segment. So please, this can all be avoided one of two ways. One, if you're going to, if you've decided you want to produce shop drawings and your life's not fulfilled enough just doing design drawings, so you also need to be a shop drawing producer, draw the tendons, uniform tendons, in exactly the same spacing if you want a uniform pre-compression. Don't bend them. The second and better way, much more better, as my kids used to say, just draw these as design drawings. Tell the shop drawing supplier, um, the detailer, that you want five kips a foot, or eight kips a foot, or 26.6 kips a foot, or whatever you want. Allow them to do it. They know the code, they know the spacing, the key. it's on your drawings anyway, but they know it. Um, and they won't bend those. They, no shop drying detailer will ever start bending uniform tendons. This is only something, really, I'm sorry to say it, that young engineers have started doing because they're using software, in my opinion, that they don't really understand. So, okay, digression number one, we'll go back to our regular scheduled, scheduled programming, but when I'm doing this example and I'm, you know, we've got the 16.24 kips per foot, that is achieved by a uniform spacing of tendons that doesn't clump up, doesn't group up, doesn't do anything. And if it were to run into any openings, you just anchor at that opening. You stop that tendon. You don't try to run it around anything. Okay, I hope that's clear. Like I said, back to our example. Let's determine the equivalent frame properties. Now, PT Data uses the equivalent frame method, as we've discussed. Uh, ADAPT did and still does, to the best of my understanding. Um, these programs together were the dominant programs and have designed literally billions of square feet. This is the method that's built into both of those programs. Now, equivalent frame, what's it equivalent to? Actually, that was an interesting question. This is a paper uh, written in 1961 by Jean Corley, uh, Sozin and Cease. See, you can see it now. You've seen it on the internet, so it must be true. 1961, they are discussing, effectively, they're telling us what's equivalent. Um, the development of this method was, was the topic of the paper. And they say the structure was designed in such a way that the torsional and flexural resistances uh, provided were nearly the same as in the slab analyzed by the finite difference methods. Now, 1961, they were apparently referring to finite element method as finite differences methods, but that's what they were doing. That's what this equivalence is supposed to be. So let's see how it's achieved. Let's pull out the slab in our design strip. It's 29.5 feet wide. I can calculate the moment of inertia of that simply. BH cubed over 12, so I do that. I've got an eight inch slab and I've got a design strip of 29 foot six inches. Now, Come over here for just a second. If, if you were a Cal Poly or a UCLA student of mine, we did this for beams. 
This was infinitely rigid, where the beam intersected the column. So it went to the center line of column. From the face of column to the center line of column, that was infinitely rigid. And all Cal Poly students, and towards the end of my time at UCLA, I actually had all of these fixed end moment carryover factors and rotational stiffness factors calculated by the students as part of their project. So. Um, if you don't understand this, go to one of my Cal Poly students and they hopefully still remember how to do this or can pull out their project and do it. But point here, in this particular case, this section is not infinitely rigid. There's an intersection of a 29 foot 6 wide slab that we're designing that intersects with a column of a substantially smaller dimension. So that intersection is not capable of full 100% fixity. So part of this equivalent frame method is to come up with a stiffness inside that joint. And this is what PT data does. So the slab beam moment of inertia is taken divided by one minus the T C2 column dimension and the L2 span dimension. So in this case, the C2 column dimension, it's 14 by 18 column, the 18 inches is in the direction of analysis, that's always the C1. One is always the direction of analysis. Two is always the perpendicular direction, perpendicular to the direction of analysis. So that dimension is 14 inches. So we come up with in the zone intersecting the column of 1.084 times the slab moment of inertia, the slab beam moment of inertia. Now, you might say, well, that's close enough to one. Why, why don't we just ignore this? But I'm trying to be anatomically correct and do exactly what our computer program is, is doing. So just like everybody else, I'm sure uh, you've sat through all of the hand analysis of the computer programs that you use for post tensioning, and I'm just catching up. But this is, this is what our program does, and I will show you by hand every single step. So back to this. Inside the intersection of the column, we have 1.084 times the slab beam moment of inertia. The rest of the span just has the slab beam moment of inertia. That's pretty straightforward. Like I said, the Cal Poly students know how to do this. I'm not going to go through this, but previous lectures, I, I went through putting this through a unit rotation using um, uh, moment curvature relationship, moment area, setting deflections and rotations equal to zero at one point, calculating the fixed end moment required to do that, calculating the carryover and calculating the rotational stiffness. You know, if this, if this did not have any, uh, if it had a constant moment of inertia and a constant E from one end to the other, this would be WL squared over 12, this would be 0.5, and this would be 4 EI over L. So we're pretty close to that. But like I said, I'm, I'm showing you exactly what our computer program does, and it does this. You could have stiffer torsional members, you could have edge beams. These things can all change. So the rotational stiffness of the slab beam is, I'm just taking these and plugging in the values now. I'm leaving E as constant. In this example, the uh, modulus elasticity of the column and the, the F prime C of the column is the same as the uh, slab, the 5000. So we'll just leave E as a constant and they will, it will end up falling out. So for the 15 foot slab beam, 4.072 times E times the moment of inertia of the slab band, of the slab beam, divided by 15 feet, convert that to inches, and I come up with a 341.69 E rotational stiffness of the 15 foot section of this. Now we have a 30 foot section, the mid bay, same process, 4.037 E, moment of inertia of the same 8 inch slab with the 29.5 foot width, divided by L of 30 feet converted to inches, 169.37. Okay.
equivalent column properties. This is similar to what we did in, a, in you know, for you Cal Poly students and UCLA students in your design project. Now we're going to look at the column. The column does intersect and have a rigid zone inside the slab. This will be assumed to be infinitely rigid for that four inches that gets to the center line of an eight inch slab. It's a 10 foot two tall column. Um, the moment of inertia of that column is bh cubed over 12. And the column stiffness uh, itself, remember I had given you this, or I'm sorry, I haven't told you that yet, but I just gave you this. Again, using the same process, um, moment area relationship, moment curvature, this uh, was determined to be 4.57 EI over L. Again, if this didn't have an infinitely rigid zone, this would be 4 EI over L. We're matching computer programs. So I've got the moment of inertia of the column and I, I plug in the rotational stiffness of the column itself and I get 254.79. Okay, this is all basically the same as we did in the beam design example for you students of mine. This is where it gets different. Okay, this, this is, I don't know, the magic. This is what was really critical in what Gene Corley and all the people developing this method came up with. Now, this whole thing is equivalent. We're, we're trying to be equivalent to what we would get using a finite element analysis. And by the way, just some of you young folks, finite elements are not new. Uh, they were developed, actually, that whole method was developed in the 40s, kind of similar time that this equivalent frame was also developed. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, they started both moving forward a lot, mainly because computers were entering the scene and it was going to be more than just theoretically possible. We were actually having the ability to run these problems. But it really wasn't until the 80s that computers could actually make it into a design office at a reasonable cost and it was cost effective and efficient to actually use a computer to do these things. But, but both these methods have been around for decades before I think most people realize they were around. So back to this, how, how are we equating the two? In a, in a method that could really be used quickly, be done by hand, uh, put into a computer program and not take literally a half an hour to run, which is what back in the old days this used to actually take. If you really wanted to do a finite element analysis, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it was the torsional member. Now, the way that this got to be equivalent, if this was truly a, had no connection, had no continuity of slab, and it really was 29 foot six of some slab that had free edges, just connected to air, then we would just stop. We would use the properties that we have. But the fact that this continues on needs a modification. There is some stiffness due to the fact that this membrane continues. That part of the membrane provides rotational stiffness to this system. That's not accounted for yet. But the way that is done is an internal torsional member placed in the plane of the columns. That's how it's done. Now, I'm really not here to teach the entire equivalent frame method. I'm reminding you, hopefully you've seen it, and if not, pull out McGregor, and it, it's, there are plenty of good resources out there for it. Um, remember finite elements, so that's what we're trying to match. Now, I was really fortunate. It, I was at Berkeley in 1989, and I was taking I was lucky enough to take finite elements from Professor Ed Wilson. I also took his computer programming course. So I had him for two courses and he was fantastic. Um, a lot of my method of teaching I think came from his method of teaching. And he's still around. I actually just communicated with him. Ironically, he's really not a fan of the uh, response spectral modal analysis that we most of us use for dynamic analysis. So, And he and I were discussing that. but. Um, that's a different thing. So he was fascinating in that he was probably the best person in the world to be teaching this class because he was, had, had written SAP. He was in the process, I believe, of writing SAFE at that time. So nobody was more on top of this than he was. But instead of promoting it as the greatest thing in the world, he was the one that was the most wary of it. 
he wanted to make sure nobody abused it. So our homework assignments were showing where you got error, showing where you got dramatic or, or significant differences in the analysis and in the results, depending on what you assumed. So we would start off with a large mesh, a large size mesh, and we would define that with his software. And he would remind us that the only compatibility points in that mesh were the corners. So it was a four, four node uh, plate element with compatibility here and here. Not no compatibility necessarily between any other points. These things could be doing completely different things. Force wise, deflection wise, between these elements at these points. The only point of compatibility were the nodal intersections. So he wanted to make sure we understood that and as, as we grew this we would get inaccuracies because there were large portions of the mesh that had no consistency between the two, were not compatible. So of course the idea was to tighten the mesh and everybody thought well we'll tighten the mesh and get better answers. But then when we would really tighten the mesh what happens is the number of calculations required to make compatibility at all nodes increases exponentially. And with every calculation, there's some error. There is some error involved in the compatibility between four elements. You have to, we had to set what we would allow the error to be, but if you didn't allow some error, it would never, you'd never finish. It would run forever. So we would have to run his programs, and we, that was back when we wore watches before we all had iPhones. We would run, start the program, look at our watch, write the time down, and sit there and talk with our friends and wait until the computer finally finished. And we would note that time. And we would see the time was related to how many calculations were being done to solve this problem. Now, the favorite thing that he said, the thing that stuck with me forever, and I've kind of lived my professional life always remembering this, he said, be wary, be careful of using this method. Always have a secondary method that you can go to to verify your results. Don't for, take for granted any of the results you ever get out of the finite element method. And I've never forgotten him saying that. And when it comes from the guy writing it, you listen. I listened. Now I really like the finite element method. I think most of these issues have been resolved. I think we get uh, accurate enough reasonable moments and deflections from this. I, I think it's fine. I use it myself um, when I feel it's necessary. But as we're going to discuss as we go through this design example, my issues are more with how post-tensioning has been applied. How equivalent loads are analyzed within the programs that are being used, how secondary moments um, are being used, how the minimum steel are, is being calculated on the top and on the bottom, things like that. Those are more the issues that I have questions about. I do a lot of reviews. I've seen a lot of finite element software programs that use post-tensioning, and I've got a lot of questions. So. I don't have the answers because I don't have those programs, but those of you using those programs, I assume have those answers and uh, have delved in. So we'll, I'll pose the questions that I would ask of you if I was peer reviewing as we move through and you can prepare your answers and I will learn something. Okay, so how do we do this torsional member? How do we come up with this that makes that accounts for that stiffness of it being a membrane and not a free-floating element. This is an elevation. I'm looking at the column. The column is the C1 dimension, which is 18 inches. The slab depth intersecting this is 8 inches. We don't have a cap. We don't have an edge beam. So this is it. This is, this is the true flat plate that we are designing. By the way, the C2 dimension is the column dimension in and out of the plane, and that's 14 inches. That comes in right here. So I'm sure Jack Maley explained in great detail, and in 1989, hopefully I understood where this came from and why this is the equation for the torsional stiffness of the torsional member. I don't remember anymore, but I'm sure it's right. 
and I learned it from Jack Maley, so it must be correct, and I'm comfortable with that. This C factor in here has its own, not really complicated, not really messy, but its own equation, where X in this equation is the shorter dimension of this torsional member, which is eight inches, and Y is whatever the longer dimension of that rectangle intersection is, and in that case, this is 18 inches. It's the column C1 dimension. So these go into here, this gets calculated, goes into here, and out comes the torsional member stiffness. So we have two torsional members coming in for this, this C value, it's the sum of, so remember, It doesn't matter if I'm looking at this column or this column, it's the same, but there's one, two, one, two torsional members. If I was on the edge of the building and I only had the column at the corner, I would have one torsional member. But I'm inside the building, interior, design strip, I've got two torsional members. I plug these numbers in, get a C value, take that C value, put it in the torsional member, 9EC, divided by the width of 29.5 feet. This is the equation I'm using. The C2 value of the column is 14 inches. L2, the perpendicular to the amount of the width of the design strip, 29.5. And I come up with a torsional stiffness value of 126.94 E. Very good. The trick in this, and what, what is making this frame equivalent to what you should expect in a finite element analysis is right in here. We take the column stiffness that we have and we've calculated, and we're gonna create an equivalent column stiffness. This equivalent column stiffness is, what the method is really doing is decreasing the stiffness of the column itself because the slab is actually stiffer through torsion. It's, it's got a stiffer, um, rotational stiffness than we've actually calculated because of the continuity effect of the membrane. So the way this method, this method could increase the slab stiffness if it wanted to. They chose a long time ago that what we we're going to do is actually decrease the columns, create an equivalent column stiffness. So that is accomplished by one divided by one over the sum of the column stiffnesses and we've got one above and one below, so we'll have two, plus one over the torsional members. Remember, this K torsion has the fact that there are two torsional members in it already. So, one over, one over, two column stiffnesses, one over torsional stiffness. So I get an equivalent column stiffness of 101.6 times the modulus of elasticity. Now I've got the column stiffness, and the slab beam stiffness. This torsional stiffness got into this. So I'm back to a column and a slab. Kind of like, a lot like what we did in the design project for you Cal Poly and UCLA students. I wanna do the same thing. I'm getting set up for a moment distribution and I wanna use, I need to know what the distribution factors are. This is exactly what we did before. The distri distribution factor from A to B Remember what A to B is. Distribution factor for this joint, at A looking to B. That's what distribution factor A, B means. Distribution factor B, A means I'm standing at B, looking back at A, trying to figure out the distribution factor to this side. So, standing at A, looking at B, I've got a 15-foot slab framing in. I've got divided by the sum of everything, the 15-foot slab framing in, and the equivalent column. This has got the torsional members in it. It's got the fact that there are two columns in it. So, once I've got this equivalent column, it's just one number now. I don't have to worry about column above, column below, um, torsional member, or anything. So, I get a distribution factor for any unbalanced moment at A, looking towards B, I'll use 0.771 of that will go to the slab, to the slab beam. The remainder is gonna go to the columns, just like it did in the design project, and we won't worry about that right now. 
I'm not going to worry about that at all in the example, but we'll know that the rest is in the columns. The distribution factor standing at B looking back at A has a 15 foot, that's a 15 foot slab in the B to A section. The sum of stiffnesses framing into that joint are the 15 foot slab, the 30 foot slab, and the equivalent column. So I plug these numbers in. The distribution factor when I'm standing at B looking back at A, 55.8% of unbalanced moment will go in that direction. When I look at the distribution factor from B looking at C, looking across that big drive aisle, I've got that is a 30 foot slab beam section. The sum of all stiffnesses framing into that column is the 15 foot slab band, slab beam from one side, the 30 foot slab beam from the other side, and then the equivalent column. So the distribution factor at B looking towards C Remember, this is symmetric, so I didn't draw the other side, but at B, looking towards C, C is somewhere over here, that distribution factor that's going to go right here is 0.277. And this entire system is symmetric, so these values will start just reversing. So at the far end, we will have the same 0.771. As we come in, will it be at 0.558? And we come and cross that joint, it'll be at 277. So completely symmetric system. And we will see that as I set up the moment distribution.